Welcome to Money Congruous, where we discuss personal finance and investment tips. We are committed to helping people create wealth and achieve financial freedom. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse and Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Alright then, let's head into today's conversation. Hello Mimi, good evening, how is it? Well, uh, you? I'm doing good. Alika, we seem to be running a little bit late, so you join us. Soon. Okay, okay, no problem. no problem. Is Jerome also ready? Let me continue. Hello, Prince. How is it? Hello, Prince, if you're speaking. Oh, Adam, I'm here. I saw you. Um, you, you mentioned my name on the page. I was actually on Canada's. Um, Space. Um, okay. Yeah, I think I was another space with Siram and then uh, Paulina. Yeah. So I just had to quickly. So oh, okay. Yeah. So we, we are here. Oh, we are okay. here. Oh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Because for a moment I was beginning to wonder, hey, where's everyone? <laughs> oh no, we are here. We are around the corner. <laughs> you know, okay. actually, you know, a lot of things are going on. So at least you get yeah, 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 spaces yeah. here and there just to get yourself updated and all that. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Rich and T is here. Everyone is here. Okay. Sayam, so, yeah, I've sent you an invite so that you can join us. Hi, everyone. I, I, I guess uh, that I must have thrown them out when I got in. So to this this evening we will be we will be looking can at um, the Ghana earning service. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Are you yeah. and Elikem using the same um because I can hear both your voices? Oh, are you serious? You are using the same distance, unless maybe you, are, you co-host uh, Adam. I okay. Let me log in. Okay, what happened was I had to start the space because Elio Kem was running late. So let me let me log in with my account and Elio Kem can take over. Okay, all right. That's fine. And then the technical challenge, um, Prince, can you please confirm to me if Adam is still on? No, I think Adam is off now. Okay, so to come back. Can, okay, can. great. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You are all right. Um, pardon the delay. We'll start in a quick moment. Okay, guys. Hello, everyone. How are you doing? We are well. Okay. Wonderful. Pardon me. I, I know you guys have been on for a minute, and it's like I'm coming to restart it. Pardon me. Um, I'm glad to hear everyone is doing well. Let's get straight into today's conversation since I guess introductions have been done. Today, we are come to talk about something that I'm absolutely impressed by. When I've been going on, I was like, wow, this is an activity that requires a lot of support. This is an activity that's very impressive that we need to laud the people behind it. So today we've invited um, one of the, in fact, look, we've invited the brain behind this and um so yeah, we have Jerome on with us. Um, Jerome, how are you doing? Hello, Jerome. If you are speaking, please unmute and speak up. Hello, hello. Ah uh, yes. I. Good evening, Jerome. How are you doing? I'm good. How about you? I'm great, my brother. I'm great. At this at this moment, this in the last couple of weeks, you have been one of my favorite people because you've done something groundbreaking that not a lot of people have done. In fact, I doubt anybody has done it, and I thought it was quite ingenious. So, um, to to in, can you introduce yourself to our audience? Let's understand uh, what your background is, what you do for your day job, and even as a hobby, so that we understand where you are coming from, and then we can get into the survey that you did. First of all, thank you for the kind words. I'm happy to know that um, the work has been appreciated. My name is Jerome. I'm a chartered accountant by profession. Uh, by day, I work in a B2B um, telecommunications firm, or let me rather say media technology firm is more accurate, but I'm a finance and admin manager. I also moonlight as a political risk consultant for a global consulting firm. And then my favorite job is that I've been the editor of cdtalk.com for close to 11 years now and so i really enjoy writing about ghana's economy and the finance space as a whole so that's 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 what i do 
Oh, that's great to hear. So you've, you've, uh, I like that term, you moonlight. And uh, I see that CD Talk is doing a lot of good work, introdu- telling more people about our economy and what's going on in the money side of things. Um, we appreciate the work you do. Um, so about this survey, we, some months ago, there was a link going around inviting people to share their thoughts on or share their uh, answers to the survey. And I understand that it went, it went really fast, way faster than you expected. Can you tell us a bit about this survey, what it's about and why you did it? And then we can lead into the journey of how you put everything together. Well, I think what motivated me was I looked at the U.S. personal finance piece and I'm just so envious of the way when people are speaking about their finances, they are able to relate it to their peers. So somebody who lives in, say, um, San, Francisco, San Francisco can say that I'm making maybe 200,000 US dollars a year. The median income is maybe 150,000. The median household has about 500,000 US dollars in savings and and um, it costs about say 1 million US dollars to retire in San Francisco. If I want to move to Nashville, um, I'm probably going to need only 500,000. So I'm just so envious of the way their personal finance conversations are so data driven. When you look at say the Twitter timeline, for example, somebody can say, um, I'm not leaving Ghana because I'm making 10,000 Ghana cities a month. And somebody will say, you give me only 3,000, I will not leave Ghana. And you realize that um, there's no benchmark essentially um, to determine whether somebody is doing well or somebody is not doing well in terms of either earnings or savings. So I said that, okay, let's see if it's possible um, for us to leverage on social media and I mean digital tools to try to get a ballpark figure. Let's say we are all on Twitter. How much does the average 25-year-old make on uh, who is on Twitter make? So I'm, I'm just so curious about uh, the data because I think it helps um, for people who are planning to really understand where they are because I have conversations with my friends who I think make a lot of money. You speak with them, they'll tell you that, no, maybe they are falling behind. And I just wanted some objective measure to try to make our conversations about money more informed and and not just uh, be based on wild guesses. And so I designed the survey, I showed it to a few of my friends in the financial industry, and they gave me some pretty good feedback. So for example, when in, in the first draft of my survey, when I looked at how many months of expenses do you have saved up, I started with one to three months. And then my friend Gamele Mate, who works for IC, told me, um, no, you may want to introduce zero into it. It didn't cross my mind that anybody would have zero months of expenditure saved up. But then, um, I mean, this is, uh, what should I say, a spoiler, but it ended up that about 40% of people had zero months of expenditure saved up. So the feedback I got really was really insightful. I really helped to inform uh, the survey. And then when I when I put it out, there I I had initially expected to get about one thousand respondents over three months. So I I thought one thousand respondents would be a pretty good um, sample size for the data to be informative. And then I put it out. I'm I'm getting lots of retweets, and I say, okay, this is going nice and then i wake up the next morning i have about 750 respondents already 
and I said, wow, this is amazing. I cannot do this work on my own. So I reached out to my friend, um, Alfred Apia. He's an economist and data scientist based in Canada. And he made the data analysis and visualization so much, so much better, so much faster than I could have expected. And so having got about 750 respondents, I decided let's put out the first um, bit of information to try to encourage more people to fill the form. And so I did that. I think the whole survey lasted for about 10 days or less, and I ended up with over 1,800 respondents, which was just mind-blowing. So I am so grateful to people. I, and we put the data out. The full raw data is out for researchers, academics, media, anybody who wants to play around with the data is out there. And the reason why I did this was because I feel like it's not my project I feel like it's a Twitter project. I just happened to have spearheaded it. But the way people shared it, I, Mimi shared it on LinkedIn. I had retweets and um, tweets encouraging people to fill it from Kali J to Bridget Otu to Gary L. Smith. It was just like, it wasn't, it wasn't Jerome's project. It's like, we all want this data. So I, after the analysis, I put the data out. It's, it's free to download. Use it for your um, thesis, for your pro grant proposals, whatever you want to do with it. It's because I feel like this is open source. So many people contributed to it, and um, people should have um, the data. Yeah, so that's that's uh, basically it about the, how the survey started and, and how we got such a fantastic response. That's great. That's a very selfless act you've done. And um, the, the, the problem of data and comparison and making database decisions is a big problem in Ghana. When uh, Sometimes we speak on money convos about when people want to set up business and they'll say, oh, somebody started this kind of business, so I'm also going to do some. That's how a lot of times these things go. But with this kind of data, I'm, I'm imagining a few years down the line, this goes on and people can get good demographic data to even start small businesses to know that, okay, if I do this kind of thing, targeting this kind of people, this is where um, I can, uh, this is what I can uh, expect in terms of income or how well the business will do. And then for people who are employees or even students who want to think about the kind of career that they want to go into, it gives them good idea of the industry that they want to go. It's not just, oh, banking makes a lot of money, oil and gas, so everybody wants to try to go to those ones. There may be other hidden gems that are in there. So m massive respect to you for doing this. Before we head into some of the insights, uh, just a, a, a last comment or compliment I want to give to you is the way you wrote the article is well written. When you said that you were the editor of CD Talk, then I was like, ah, this makes a lot of sense because... You, you, you stated a lot of the flaws or the gaps, not flaws, the gaps in the research that you did um, in terms of the age demographic is very skewed towards younger people, um, pe pe people who have access to the internet. So people can't expect that it should be, um, it should be um, representative of the whole of Ghana. You, you put in a whole lot of disclaimers that made a lot of sense and also gave opportunity for people to pick it up from there. And, make recommendations okay next time do it this way do that that way it felt very open and you, you talked about open source reading the article i felt that this was not someone who was imposing any ideas on us the person was starting a conversation starting an exploration so massive respect to that um adam i can you please um share the link to the cd talk on the uh on the space or a reply to the tweet so that anyone who wants to know what we are talking about can refer to that. And in that article, there's a link to the source data that Jerome was referring to. So, um, yeah, Jerome, do you have any, any, uh, any, any comments on your writing style for this particular article? Well, I was, um, I tried as much as possible not to, um, have people say, um, the data to let the data do something that it does not do. 
Um, I think that was very key because I didn't want a case where people would say, okay, so this is the average earning of Ghanaians or this is the average savings of Ghanaians because I understand that um, our method is quite limited. And so we, I didn't, I, I think that's why I, in, from the introduction, I spent quite a lot of time talking about the shortfalls of the survey. Um, with that said, I didn't want people to also think that the survey was therefore unnecessary. Um, as, I mean, this is a personal finance platform. I can, I can talk a lot of personal finance here and, we know that as finance people, we know that the way people um, talk about money and wealth is in um, comparison with their peers. So they don't look at wealth in a vacuum. If I'm not happy with my salary, it's not just about the amount of money. It's about the amount of money compared to Mimi. Or if I'm not happy with my savings, it's about my level of savings compared to Adam. So people just don't look at their income and their savings in a vacuum. And so even though this survey was skewed, I felt like this survey was people who were my peers, as in people um, age um, 26 to 35, um, people who are educated with uh, a degree or a postgraduate degree, um, people who uh, probably are unmarried or even they are married, they don't have kids. It's, it's essentially um, this demographic, the demographic of people on this piece, this data represents the financial situation they are in. So even though the survey is not representative, uh, representative of the whole country, it still gives us an idea of where are our peers at. And so with that disclaimer, because I understand not everybody who was reading the article was going to be a Twitter person, okay? So I needed to explain that this doesn't represent the whole country. But then if you are in this demographic, you are going to realize this is what, what essentially your peers are making and what they have saved up. And I also understand that um, a lot of researchers will be looking at this data because there simply isn't enough data on savings and income in Ghana. So I just wanted to put the disclaimers there so that if a researcher is looking at it, they will understand I'm not making any bold claims. I'm just saying this is the data gathered from this particular demographic, and this is what it says. If you have any suggestions, I'm more than ready to listen to them because the plan is to improve this. I want to um, get better questions. I want to be better at targeting people. I want to be better at analyzing the data. I want it to be more representative, and I want it to be more useful. And so I'm not, um, as you were saying, imposing uh, my views or my understanding of the data. I'm just gathering it, telling you what the data says. I'm more than happy to listen to anybody who has feedback for improving it because, as I said at the start, if you look at the first survey I had drafted and compare it to the final one, you realize that the feedback I had got was so insightful, it made it better and I know that the more feedback I get, the better the next one will be, and that's what I'm working towards. That's great. I, I like I like that there would be there will be improvements in future, you know. And so yeah, Let, let's get into the second the next part of this conversation. At this point, um, I'd, I'd encourage people to ask questions. Uh, what we the purpose of this part of the conversation is really to to try to assess our preconceived notions and see if there were any surprises. Do we think, uh, questions like, do we think age comes with uh, increased income, the, as in the older you are, the more you, you're expected to earn, or the older you are, the more 
you know, money you would have had saved? You know, these are some of the things that maybe we are thinking about or what kind of industries um, make certain kinds of money. So we'll delve into it, but feel free to send me a message, a DM if you have any questions. And then I would ask uh, Jerome on your behalf and to um, my regular um, members, uh, member speakers, Mimi, Adam, Seyram, please feel free to jump in, Prince, jump in and if, if you have any thoughts on this. So Jerome, first question, age and income, is there a correlation? Yes, there's definitely a correlation between age and income. And mm-hmm. this can be explained um, by the fact that um, older people in our survey were more likely to be higher educated, um, to um, essentially have had the opportunity to earn more over the years and to save more over the years. And if you look at our survey, we realize that there's not really a lot of people um, with a high number of dependents. And that's important because if you are a bit older and say you don't have children, then that means that you have the opportunity to have saved more than say, um, if our survey captured lots of older people, but then also captured people who have lots of children or lots of dependents is probably a better term. So in our survey, I'm not making any general claims, but just in this survey, we realized that um, people who were older tended to make um, higher income and to have higher savings. So, uh, for example, if we look at um, people aged 35 and above, um, over 40% of them, so about 44% of them, make at least 10,000 Ghana cities a month. And this compares to only about... um, 21% of people aged 26 to 35, and only about 7% of people who are 25 and below. So as far as um, age, as far as this uh, survey is concerned, um, people who are older tended to make more money. Okay. All right. So there's there's a correlation with age and and income, and you, you explained possible reasons, more work experience or more years of working, um, potentially higher education. At this point, you know, you mentioned some numbers and I just want to refer to the article and give some highlights to give people some context because you use 10,000 as a reference amount. I remember when I was starting work, I finished university some years ago and I was looking at how many years do I want it to... Uh, I expect that within three years of finishing university, I should make... 10,000 CDs a month. And and uh, this was even after tax. Jerome, to confirm, these numbers that we are talking about, is this after tax or before tax? This is after tax. Um, so to kind of uh, give a bit of context, we were not looking at monthly salaries. We're not looking at basic salaries. We're looking at total earnings. Now, this is for two reasons. The first reason is that of um, my first premise that general salary salaries are low. Um, and we have had a cost of living crisis where we've seen prices rise about 50% on average over the last year. And so the only way people um, were surviving is if they had Uh, multiple streams of income. So if we're just looking at basic salaries, it may give us the wrong picture. The second reason is that if we look especially at our demographic, uh, there are people who believe a lot in the gig economy. And so we have people who may not, who may have one job and have about two or three different side jobs. Or we have somebody who doesn't have um, a traditional job at all, but then they are making income from different um, gigs. And so we wanted it to be comparable by not looking at 
basic salary. We wanted the full earnings. So somebody may have a basic salary of say 5,000 Ghana cities. And if we are looking at and say there's somebody else who has a basic salary of say 10,000. But if we are looking at how much money they actually bring in every month, you realize the person who has 5,000 maybe as a photography business, uh, maybe sells shoes on Instagram, um, maybe does some remote uh, programming work on the weekends or something, and so may actually have a higher level of income than the person who only has the basic salary. So we wanted total earnings. And I think, um, especially given the kind of responses we got, like, from the number of hello can you i think i lost jerome can anyone hear me yes yes my has gone now okay jerome if you're speaking you are muted okay well while we circle back while we wait uh, to hear from jerome um yeah so the the dates the numbers that we are looking at the income figures are total income not just from your main job from all your sources of income and uh, they're almost giving some examples, and I'm pretty sure some of the some, some young people are also thinking about their betting winnings. That one too could is something that you should be including in your total income. So yes, all sources of income. But yeah, I was I was giving an analogy of uh, for comparison, right? When I when I finished university some years ago, and I was thinking about my career. I, I wanted I was imagining how long will it take for me to get to ten thousand CDs a month with inflation and all that. Maybe right now it's is the equivalent of maybe fifteen or twenty thousand, but I wanted to get there in three thousand. No, I did not achieve that aim. No, but these are some of this kind of data can give you the context. I would refer to the survey, and we want everyone to go read the survey, so we'll just be doing high level. But I think it would be good to get this kind some baseline of so that when we talk about certain percentages, people would know. So, according to the survey. Majority of the respondents in 5,000 cities a month or below, or actually below 5,000 cities a month, majority and that um, a month. So 1,000 cities and below is 8%. 1,000 to 2,500 is 18%. And then 2,500 to 5,000 is, or just under 5,000 is 29%. So you sum those up and you are getting um, a, a majority falling below 5,000 uh, 5, a month. Going higher, 5,000 to 7,500 is 15%. 7,500 to 10,000 is 10%. Then we have um, above, uh, we have 10,000 to 15,000, 9%. 15,000 to 20,000, 4%. 20 to 30,000, 5%, 30 to 50,000, 2%, then 50,000 and above, 1%. So again, remember, we are not saying this is representative of the whole of Ghana, but we are, we are looking at respondents among people who were active on Twitter. So majority of the respondents were between 26 and 35, I believe. Yeah. Okay, so we've seen that there's a correlation be between... Um, there's a correlation between age and earnings and also savings. I think some lessons and implications we can pick up from it is we perhaps there should be some level of patience, right? We, we talk about personal finance and not comparing yourself to other people. It's good that you need you know who you are comparing yourself to. If you want to rush and compare yourself to a 45-year-old person who is driving a Land Cruiser and wearing Kaftan every day, maybe... That's not a good comparison when you are 25 years old. You need to put in the work. You need to put in the time, build your work experience so that you can command more, um, a, more, um, a higher salary or a higher billing amount if you are charging for your services. Um, also, you may want to look at higher education. It's something that Jerome mentioned, and perhaps we may delve d deeper into that about the correlation between education and uh, income. I found a bit of a, a surprise there. I thought there would be a higher correlation, but when we look at um, people below senior high school, you realize that um, none of them 
make people with an education level at senior high school and below, none of them make twenty thousand and above. Two point eight percent make uh, ten thousand to twenty thousand. Four point two percent make five thousand to ten thousand, and ninety three percent make less than five thousand. So it goes to tell you, as you're thinking about education and what it takes to earn a higher income, just based on this data and where it's going, I think a better idea is to increase your level of education. Among those with a professional certification only, 62% of them earn less than 5,000. But at this point, we start realizing that the percentage of those, who, the percentage of this age group, of this um, education group, who are earning higher amounts increases. So 23%, uh, no, 16% earn 5,000 to 10,000 compared to 4.2% for those who only have um, senior high school education and below. And then there's 14.6% who earn 10,000 to 20,000 and 6.2% who earn 20,000 and above. Again, this I think that's, this part is a very sweet spot where people are able to earn more because they have increased their education. It gets more interesting among the graduates and the postgraduates. Among graduates, um, 59% earn 5,000 and below, which is a lower percentage than those with just a professional certification. So that looks better. Um, 23% earn 5,000 to 10,000. 10% earn... 10,000 uh, to 20,000. And also switching to the postgraduate, I think this is where really the, the needle is, mo is moved a lot. Post among postgraduates, you have those making less than 5,000 are only 36%. So that percentage of people making less than uh, 5,000, it becomes smaller as the education level goes up. And then 5,000 to 10,000 is 29%. Again, a higher number, a higher percentage for a higher income group. And then 10,000 to 20,000, it goes to 19.5%. This is very, this is interesting compared to those with just a graduate degree, um, having, who are just 10% of that group who are making 10 to 20,000. So 10% compared to 19.5%. I think that's, that's a sort of a wink wink. And then on the higher end, which I'm sure all of us wish will be 20,000 and above, it's 14.7% of postgraduates are making 20,000 and above compared to 6.1 for graduates and 6.2 for professional certification only. These are some insights that I think are quite um, good for uh, interesting to find out about education. There are various myths and cons uh, pre uh, misconceptions or opinions about education and how it impacts someone's earning ability. I'm curious to know what my, uh, my other speakers and Jerome think about this. Jerome, what do you think about education? Based on this, should people keep studying more? They should drop out of school or not even bother going to school? Okay, this is, this is where it gets difficult because uh, there could be two things happening. It could be that people who are well-educated are making more money, or it could be that um, people who are making more money uh, probably have had the opportunity to go for higher education, or maybe they got in at an entry level and decided that in order to uh, be able to develop their careers down the line, they may have to go seek, say, a postgraduate degree. And so it's, we can't really, what, what the data is telling us is that higher education is correlated um, with higher earnings. But, you know, I don't want to bring in any causation um, discussions in here, but um, speaking with anecdotal evidence, um, when immediately I secured a stable job, the first thing I wanted to do was to get my postgraduate degree um, because previous jobs where you are not too sure of whether the salary is going to come or whether you have job security, 
uh, you may want to try to save as much as possible. But once you have the security of a job, um, knowing that your salary is going to come, you are not going to get fired, the business is not going to go um, down, then you may you are confident enough that let me take on the additional financial burden of a postgraduate degree. And so I, I, I would advise people that they should, I mean, you should definitely get a degree. Looking at demo, the demographic data, the degree, it seems to be like so few people had only a senior high school education. It was mostly minimum tertiary. So that one is non-negotiable. You should have a tertiary, um, you should have a tertiary education. And now not speaking to the survey, but speaking solely um, about like general career, personal finance advice, I would say a postgraduate degree when you are at an entry level, as in you've not yet secured a job and you already have a postgraduate degree, may not be the um, advantage you think it is. If you do step in, you should definitely get a postgraduate degree. But if you still don't have a job, I would recommend a postgraduate degree if you are thinking of going into academia. But say... Um, you are thinking of working at a bank and you've got a degree in finance and you haven't managed to secure a job after national service and you say, oh, let me get a master's in finance. That will make it easier for me to get an entry-level um, finance job. Uh, that may not really be um, realistic. So, And this is industry-dependent. I'm more familiar with the financial industry. So... I, I would say that a professional certification would be nice. Um, so um, a chartered um, ICAG, ACCA, maybe CFA, things like that, I would recommend it if you are a degree holder who's no money to get employed. But postgraduate may not necessarily be um, the key that unlocks the door for you. Okay. That's interesting. Sometimes here we talk about correlation, which the survey really is looking at, or just throwing it out there, these are observations. But then it gets more complicated when we start talking about causation. Which one caused which one? Is it, is it, the, is it the higher education that caused higher income, or was the higher income that caused higher, um, higher education. It's a, these are good points that you mentioned, and I'm sure in future surveys, you'd add additional questions that will try to dig into these issues deeper. Uh, yeah, thank you for those clarifications. Let's, let's switch over to industry. So people are in certain industries. Some people are younger and they are more open to trying different things or looking at different businesses. And uh, Or even some people may be older, but they may also be asking themselves, am I in the... I have skills, I have talents, I have money to invest. Am I investing it in the right places? So this kind of data is giving us an insight about which industries are making what kind of money. Unsurprisingly, and I'm quoting, I'm quoting your article, Jerome. Unsurprisingly, the mining and the mining oil and gas industry has the highest proportion of high income earners. As a total of 47% of respondents make at least 10,000 per month. This, I think none of us is surprised. I would like to have a show of hands if anyone is surprised about this kind of, this, this revelation about mining and oil, oil and gas. Voila, crickets, very silent. Okay, so let's go to the next best thing. We are here talking about finances and all. I thought we were in the finance sector, we were making, at least we can follow, we can give the, the oil and gas people, some close marking. But apparently, that's not the case. Or oh, Jerome, what, what is the case? Who's giving the mining and oil and gas a close marking? Okay. Um, Jerome, I think okay. you, you went mute. Okay. Uh -huh. I, I said nobody is actually giving the mining, oil and gas industry a close marking. But a distant second is technology and telecommunications. Okay. That's interesting. So... 
telecommunications like working for MTA and these are the more popular ones we know and then you mentioned that your your day job you work with a, a B2B telecom company or media tech company I may not be saying it right um, what are some of the rules that people occupy in some of these um, tech companies so that people can start looking on uh, the job man and uh, the job boards to look for these kind of rules I, I think what um, the the mining oil and gas industry and then technology and telecommunications and then surprisingly number three which was very close to technology actually was non-profits and uh, I think Jerome and no and no and no and no I mean that one I don't understand non-profits director how are you making so how are you how are you making doing better than uh, financial services do you have any insights on that i think you the the top three or shall i yeah the top three in my opinion are probably dominated by um organizations that are not ghanaian so if you talk about mining oil and gas you look at the kind of companies there uh they are probably um multinationals and so the pig is probably structured um or matches uh, what the company would pay internationally and even if it's not matching that they will be looking at bringing the salaries to match uh, the cost of living and so it's likely that that's why we see the most i mean the highest paid people in in that field because for example i think one of the things that really keeps salaries low in ghana is that once you enter with a salary it can remain unchanged um, for three four years or if you are getting a raise maybe you get 10 percent, 15 percent meanwhile you look at inflation and it's probably averaged like 22 percent um, over the past few years and so if you work for an employer who maybe takes inflation or cost of living into consideration you realize that your earnings rises much faster than it does for the general population and so i wasn't surprised by mining and the oil and gas industry I wasn't surprised by technology but for non-profits, I, I can only say that it's probably non-Ghanaian non-profits. It's, it's not Ghanaian non-profits. And even if it's Ghanaian non-profits, um, there are probably those who have had some donor funding. Because I've worked in the non-profit um, environment. Um, I worked in it for um, some years back. And what you realize is when there's donor funding, then they make sure that your compensation um, matches something that is reasonable that that is uh, that matches the cost of living but then when there's no donor funding you can go on paid for the full period um, that the organization doesn't have donor funding so i'm thinking these are either foreign non-profits or they are non-profits with foreign donor funding this is interesting based on these insights i'm just looking at mimi and serum with side eye and i remember something we were supposed to do that i haven't done maybe we should money convos we should start looking at foreign funding so that we can start we can help people make higher income <laughs> that's interesting uh, but yeah these, these are really good insights um it's, it's it's always nice when you are doing good to make the world a better place, and your your account, your bank account, your wallet, your purse is also feeling like it's also in a better place. So um, this this can go as advice to anyone who is thinking about the non-profit sector. You want to make sure that the work that you are doing is is not is is making an impact in the world and improving the world. If you feel like you want that kind of purpose, be guided and and uh, be guided about which particular employer you go and do that kind of work for so yeah that's these are some some insights that we've picked up that's great um but yeah i think 
John, can you just quickly confirm for me? So it seems financial services came in as a as a as a fourth in this ranking on industry. Am I correct? Yes, they they came mm. a close fourth um, to non profits, um, and then mm -hmm. fifth was legal services, and then communications was safe. I think that's where I ended it. Um, but if you want to look at some of the people in the bottom. Uh, we are probably uh -huh. talking about uh, traders. Um, before be, before you before before you comment, know that probably the kind of traders making huge money are not the people who fill in this this survey. So uh -huh. Uh -huh, yes, <laughs> that is That's cause I just rather so that disclaimer is necessary because we are not looking at the Makola queens here. Um, we are probably looking at IG vendors. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You know, I think this this particular line about trading good goods is something that we should be looking at over the years because I think a lot of young people are moving into that kind of um, that kind of business where everyone is selling something on the side or e-commerce or we could even just call it e-commerce. Um, I think we should keep an eye on it. Hopefully. The, as these people, these people are starting small and they are young, inexperienced, it may not be so lucrative. But if we are able to track how the trend grows to see whether we'll have our own Instagram queens or e-commerce queens and kings uh, in, in a few years, that would be interesting to know. That would tell people that, okay, so when people caught on that trend, it's actually worked out for them. And it wasn't just a fad that made them burn cash. Okay. Great, great, great. Let's so two more areas that we want. I think we should be looking at uh, savings and um, savings and retirement. There's also car and home ownership, but let's start with savings and uh, retirement. Jerome, is there a correlation between how much people, uh, how, how much they earn and how much they've saved? And I'm curious about this because. As we have conversations with people about personal finance, they keep saying, oh, the more you wait, when I, when I earn a certain amount of income or when I increase my salary or when, when I make more money, then I'll start saving. Does the surveyed results give any indication of this? Again, disclaimers, this may not be perfect data, but at least this is giving us a place to start looking. Any thoughts? Um, there is... Um a correlation it gets a little bit weaker as you go up the um, income ladder so for example um, the gap between people earning less than five thousand and those learning uh, sorry those earning less than five thousand and those earning over five thousand but less than ten thousand is quite huge um, you realize that people earning less than 5,000 cities a month, 52% of them have zero months of expenditure saved. That is quite huge. But when you jump up to the next income bracket, 5,000 to just under 10,000, you realize only 27% of them, uh, so roughly, um, you are roughly two times less likely to have zero months of savings if you earn over 5,000. So as you move up the income ladder, the very first jump um, shows a huge correlation between level of income and the level of savings. But then as you move up to the next rank, the people earning 10,000 to just under 20,000, you realize 19% of them have zero months of expenditure saved. So there isn't really that huge of a jump, like from 5,000 to the next level, huge gap. But then from 5,000 to, um, I mean, if you jump over the 10,000 barrier to just under 20,000, that's a relatively smaller um, improvement. And then when you go higher, um, so those earning between 10,000 and just under 20,000, 19% of them have zero months of expenditure saved. And then when you go to 20,000 and above, 12% um, of them 
So that's just seven percentage points better. So you realize that the more money you make, yes, the more likely you are to save. But as you move higher up the income ladder, then the savings, um, uh, the effect of income on savings is not as strong as it is uh, at the lower level. Okay, that's that's interesting. Now at this point, Mimi, I want to pull you into the conversation. If if you don't mind unmuting and joining me here. I'm looking at this data and what Jerome just described. So you are telling me that there are people in this Ghana. This Ghana's economy is like that. And there are people who are making 20000 and above. And 12% of these people have zero months of savings somewhere. Um, I'm <laughs> sure, you, I'm sure you will find many of them. <laughs> okay. This is interesting. Mimi, Adam, any, <laughs> any thoughts on this matter? Yeah, I think um, <clears throat> this is explained by um, two things. Two things come to mind. So lifestyle inflation and um, um, the, the likelihood that as you grow, your responsibilities increase. So even though you may be earning more, um, there are other mouths to feed. Um, I think lifestyle inflation happens naturally, especially, and basically lifestyle inflation is when you, um, let's say, improve your lifestyle or um, your expenses grew to um, meet your income. So um, when you have a higher income, naturally things change. Uh, if you couldn't eat certain foods or go to certain places or ride a certain car, I mean, at the end of the day, for most people, they are working to make their lives better. So this becomes an opportunity for them, you know, to do that. So I, I think that it makes sense. It makes Maybe. sense. That, yes. Can I, can I insert an example? There's an example that my brethren can relate to. At first, they were drinking, they were drinking club. Now they are drinking Heineken. Ah. <laughs> ah that's the kind of... Lifestyle inflation, you see now, yes, people are reacting. Now people understand what we are talking about. Okay, please, back to you. Yeah, so um, um, so I think that lifestyle inflation is, is if you are not deliberate about, you know, um, this income has come, what do I do with the increment? As soon as you earn it, give yourself three months and you'll be back to, you feel like, you know, there's nothing special. So I think that um, explains it a lot. Um, I'm sure even with, okay, well, I don't know, Jerome, the, the um, month cover did not include pensions, right? No, no, this, this was purely um, savings. savings. Yes. So okay. okay. In terms of an okay. emergency fund, um, it's probably the best description. Yeah, I mean, it, it makes absolute sense. Uh, okay, me. I think we will. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I, I can hear you. You said it makes absolute sense. Yeah, for you. yeah it does. Yeah. Well, on, on the positive side, I, I think it's just 12% of these people. So hopefully, all of us, as we are thinking about our own personal finances on this nice Sunday night, and thinking about how we'll be productive this week. Let's try, let's aim to be among the 78% who don't, uh, no, this will be 98, uh, 88% of such income earners who actually have some money saved aside for emergency because things do happen. Things do happen. And the number is 19% for those making 10,000 to 20,000. Let's not let this lifestyle inflation creep up on us. Let's not let, um, the increased demands on us we we are so much that we can't we don't take care of certain things that are also important in our lives okay that's that's interesting um jerome was was there any any other uh, info any information you picked up on uh, in terms of retirement savings or whether people are saving towards net or tier two or three well we didn't or I should say I didn't um, exactly ask for pension savings. And I know, I mean, for a lot of people, they wouldn't be able to tell you the figure um, in a survey um, because they probably have never asked for their 
tier two, tier three statements to even know how much is inside there. So I just wanted a ballpark figure in terms of your um, your level of savings, um, including pensions, whatever figure you have in your head, um, but less any physical assets. Uh, the reason I didn't want to include physical assets was that the valuation of physical assets is very, very subjective. So let's say um, somebody has uh, somebody has some um, saved up, say let's say ten thousand, but then they have a plot of land which they have valued at say two hundred thousand, and then they tell you the total. Um, savings they have is 210,000 but a lot can uh, the, the valuation of that land if you want to convert it to cash it could be totally different and so to simplify things i just wanted things that are denominated in, in ghana cities and and um the results showed that 52 percent of respondents have less than 10,000 ghana cities in total um, savings plus investments, including pensions, so but less any physical assets. And 14% um, have between 10,000 to just under 30,000. Um, and then at the very top, we have 7% who have, or let me add, we have about 14% who have at least 100,000 in total savings so that's how that distribution goes mm. that's interesting so among the respondents 52 percent had ten thousand or less saved that in terms of investments and savings and all that that's that's interesting that's that's a, lot, a huge number of people that is among the respondents and considering we are having this conversation on twitter spaces literally where the survey was launched and um, spread on we could be looking at each other or looking at each other's icons and see, ask ourselves, are you, which, which bracket are you in? Not exactly to give you some negative pressure, but then maybe it can be some kind of motivation. If you are thinking about your savings habits and you are, you are realizing that maybe you buy too many shoes or you spend too much money on Friday night chilling, maybe you want to give it some thought and put some money away to try to secure the future because you never know things do happen and you want to make sure that you are comfortable when these things happen or sometimes even these savings you know we've spoken about emergency fund but also these investments also go towards opportunities if you have cash and somebody comes with a, a lucrative business idea you would have investments that you can put towards it and also to jerome's point let this uh, about real estate and uh, non-cash investments or non-monetary investments not unless we, we don't want to put down anyone who has lots of land you know if you are doing that and that's your investment strategy that's great you go get them we, we think it's a good idea for you to keep doing that and this just that this data may not be so comparable uh, to you so yeah some more context for people as they are um, they are saving for car ownership, you know, your article also speaks about that. But uh, I think we, we, I want us to skip that part and go straight to another aspect that is important for people. Home ownership. Jerome, do you have any insights for us about home ownership? I, I, so the home ownership part, um, I, I think I was looking more at car ownership. I just threw in home ownership in case we would get people who are a bit older because I understand that for the demographic I'm looking at, even for the highest income earners, owning a home may be uh, something which is, is further down the line. It's not something that they can attain now, even though they are making lots of income. But I still realize that in the survey, 35% of people who end over 20,000 cities a month own the home. Now, given the fact that the demographic was really young, um, this could mean that they earn 
so much money that they, they've been able to purchase a home out of their savings or they've earned enough to qualify for a mortgage or maybe the reason why they are even earning this high is because they are from a rich background, uh, probably inherited a house and then they are working in a family business which pays them a general salary. So I, I don't want to really make too much of a case out of the home ownership just because it the, the only 10% of the respondents own the home, I mean, to start with. And so that is just roughly about 180 out of 1,800 people. And we didn't ask or I didn't ask how they came about the home, whether it was a mortgage, whether they inherited it or they purchased it out of um, their savings. And so I can't really give much more color to the, the home ownership um, question. But I I felt like very few of the respondents would own a home anyway. So I wasn't really looking at it as a major, um, shall I say, data point. Okay, okay. And, and that makes a lot of sense. It's um, uh, the, the, the savior resource really do back your initial hypothesis of only a few people would be owning a home. So I guess we could speak about the car then. It's, it's a major expense for a lot of young people. It's the first largest expense that they will be making. Do you have any insights on that one that you could share? Yes. Um, so 34% of all respondents owned cars, which is, I think, quite significant. Um, that's more than a third of respondents owned a car. And um, what we realized is that uh, it was highly correlated with age. Um, so only 14% of people 25 and below owned a car compared to 34% of people aged 26 to 35, um, 68% of people 36 to 45, and then 82% of people 46 to 59. And I want to talk about um, the 26 to 35 demographic, especially, um, because I feel like that's the age where most people are pressured to own a car. Because if you are um, younger than 25 or you are 25 and below, you probably do not earn enough to own a car and even if you did, there's so little social pressure at that age to own a car. Now, if you are 26 to 35, that's where you may earn enough to own a car or you may not earn enough to own a car, but the social pressure for car ownership in Accra um, among uh, people in my demographic, um, highly educated online, the social pressure to own a car is stronger there. If you go above 36, uh, 36 to 45, then you are probably earning enough where a car is not, it's a huge financial decision, but it's not like a make or break thing. So my interest is 26 to 35, where 34% of people own a car. Now, I I, I feel like I'm, one reason I did the survey was I'm trying to spark conversation. So people in that age range, why did you feel the need to own a car? Assuming you didn't get it from your parents, why did you feel the need to own a car at this stage? Um, looking at your income, your savings, was it a priority? Um was it something you got that made your job easier? Would public transport probably make um, you be able to save more? And I'm asking these questions because I want to spark conversations. I feel like, um, then let me use myself as an example. So you understand there's no moral, um, as I keep saying, personal finance mistakes is not a moral failure. 
personal finance is something you need to learn. It's like learning how to drive. So if you don't know it, there's no moral failure. And we take decisions sometimes that have nothing to do with personal finance. So when I um, first got a car, immediately I, that was, I think at 10, 26, I had saved up some money and my parents were generous enough to top up and I got the cheapest car I could find. But from the minute I got it, um, it really didn't match my income level at that time. Um, I, I would have saved more money if I was using public transport. But from that very time till now, it's been several years down the line, I really cannot see myself not owning a car. And I am trying to understand in making that decision, what part of it was thinking that it would be convenient, what part of it was thinking that the social pressure on me to own a car at that age because I was working. So I think, and would I be saving more money? Uh, would I have been able to do more if I didn't have a car? I mean, fuel prices have gone up by my estimation about 120% in one year, but I'm still driving. I haven't parked my car. So I am interested in these conversations. I think they make personal finance much more relatable and much more relevant than telling people save 10% of your income because that's an abstract thing. But when we start talking about um, social pressure, we start talking about expectations, we start talking about uh, what um, level of income we are, um, we are spending to impress people, um, I think it makes the it makes the conversation much more relatable. It makes people who are not finance people understand the impact of these conversations and get involved. And that's one of the reasons why I, I, I undertook this survey. That's interesting. So get, people start thinking about why they do what they do and then we can start having conversations and figuring out solutions to everything. I like that punchline you gave. Um, personal finance failures are not moral failures. I may not be quoting you right, but I think that's what you said. And that's that's an interesting thing. We all have to learn these things over time. Some are able to learn it through, exper- uh, through learning from other people. Some have to learn through um, the experience, suffering through these experiences. But, you know, speaking of learning about these things, I'd encourage everyone who's come here, just follow Money Convos here on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. And if we've, we have weekly conversations, if you've not listened to any or there's any you've missed that you want to go play back, search on YouTube, just search for Money Convos on YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcast, you hear all the conversations we've had, um, we've had on personal finance, and you would learn a lot. These are really light conversations. Light, conversations that we have like friends talking among friends about money because we feel like we weren't taught about money and personal finances and investments all throughout our many years of education and we need to fix that also if you want to take it a step further you should go follow investment friend on instagram it's at investment underscore friend where we where we don't just do talking generally but we look at your personal finance um, situation and then we can make suggestions to you it's um, personal finance coaching it's not investment advice it's not financial advice but it's it's a more targeted approach to guide you towards reaching the kind of financial independence that you want the content there is really great you would see serum and maybe doing some really exciting things I, i wish i could be i could act and, and create content the way they do, but they really make it exciting over there. They have some challenges, emergency fund challenges. They keep it exciting to get people involved and act, actively moving towards reaching their financial goals. So strongly encourage everyone, get on Instagram, follow. Even if it's not for you and you feel like you've reached and you're among the top, all the, all the data that we are looking at in the survey, you're among the top, top end of things. If everything is looking good. Share it with your friends, share it with your family, share it with people who may come De- uh, depending on you or asking you for things because when we all do well we, there will be less burden on each individual person but if you don't share this kind of information with people 
then they would be de- depending on you over and over again and you will feel that black tax you feel that burden and you may not even be able to achieve your personal goal so strongly encourage everyone just follow investment friend and money convos and keep coming and also follow jerome i i believe that what he's doing or what he's done with this TV, this thing that he started is starting a great conversation is gets going to give us good data that people can uh, can follow on to make decisions about their careers the kind of school that they want to go what kind of programs they want to do the kind of places that they may want to live in future the kind of companies that they want to work with it's it's about time ghana also had a database and all the the survey details that we are sharing or the underlying survey um, results and data is available it's open source there's a link uh, in the reply to this um, this twitter space um, tweet go to that article and also i think it's it's pinned in the space you can go there and get the the full data set and you can use it as you want just make sufficient reference to the survey so that you don't plagiarize and also we, we are able to uh, jerome will be able to track how it's it's being used um so yeah um, i'll open it up to any anyone else in on on the speakers and then mimi do you have any questions that you'd like to ask jerome before we start wrapping it up and we start thinking about the future of the survey prince anyone yeah, so I don't have a question. Great job. Um, I, I feel like this is the beginning of bigger things. Um, I think data is very essential, even for us in the financial space to be able to, you know, guide people through their finances. So thank you, Jerome, for this. I hope you continue. <laughs> um, I think you said something very interesting, which we overlook, which is pressure. And I was recently thinking about, you know, why travel has become a big deal, why everyone wants to travel, and it's because it's become an end thing. So, um, like we say during our coaching service sessions, it's always important that you think about why, the why behind why you do what you do. Um, I think it always helps you to decide whether you are really sacrificing because you want to sacrifice for something that's very important to you or you are doing it for someone else or to fit or to meet some expectations that have been set for you. So um, thank you, Jerome, for touching on that. I think it's something very essential that we hardly speak about. That's great. Thank you, Mimi. Thank you. Adam, Prince, any questions? Hello, Kim. Um, I don't have a question, but I think just like we said, uh, kudos Jerome for a good job uh, for starting a conversation that um, we need. And for me, one key part of the survey was about the savings levels, which, I mean, it brings a reality check that even people who are earning quite high amounts of money can be there without um, any kind of um, savings. So it just brings to mind an ascension that we really need to do a lot and, and prepare ourselves. Even if you are down at the lowest uh, rank of the earnings, as you go up, let's keep in mind that um, we need to work hard towards saving. And then like Jerome mentioned the issue about pressure and uh, influences. I think it's very key that we think about it and then understand why we are doing what we are doing and that will help us to reach our goals and our targets. So once again, thank you and uh, kudos. Th- thank you, Bishop Adam. Thank you. Yeah, um, again, thank you so much, Jerome, for um, joining us. Uh, thank you for do- actually doing this survey, giving us a sense of what's going on. And again, I encourage everyone, check the links that have been pinned and replied to you would read the article fully for yourself, come up with some insights. And there are a lot of disclaimers issued there. That this is not a perfect survey. This is the beginning of a discussion. This is the beginning of an exploration. So you could take everything with that context, knowing that it's not perfect. But And, and then also one of the ways it's not perfect is it's really the demographic is, is skewed towards a smaller, younger group. Keep that in mind, but at least you are not starting your decisions in the dark. You have some sense of where where things are looking for a certain area of people. Okay, Jerome, 
So the last question I have to uh, for you is, so what, what's the future of this survey looking like? How frequent, how many more questions, how are you going to expand the, and, uh, the, 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 the demographic that will be captured? And um, yeah, basically, what's the future looking like? Any, any thoughts on that? Yes, I, I want to make this a regular thing. So next year, um, I'm already looking at a possible survey. Um, we may not have the results out next year, but the data will be from next year. And one thing I have realized from putting out the data was that even though I expected lots of researchers and data scientists to jump on it, They've rather, they keep coming back to me and Alfred. Oh, have you considered this? Have you controlled for this? Um, we had really good feedback. Somebody wanted us to take the data and then adjust the weights by looking at the weights in the population census so that we have a more representative sample. Some people wanted us to run um, regressions, controlling for certain uh, variables and essentially write a full research paper on this. So I am hoping that I would be able to get some help um, in terms of people uh, dedicating their time um, to make the second survey much better, more representative, and for us to be able to bring out better insights. With the, um, we with with the limit that, or with 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 it being limited by, um, the length of the research instrument. That's one thing very key or very important to me is that an online survey must not be long, because attention spans are very short. So, even though I want to measure a lot of data. Uh, a lot of variables. Once people don't want to start filling a survey and there's next, 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 and they're like, no, I don't have time for this. I would rather be watching, I mean, a YouTube video or something. So it has to be short, but it has to measure relevant information. And so the future of this is that I'm talking to researchers to help me make the survey um, better while not making it long. I'm bringing on board more people um, who would be able to volunteer their time for us to be able to bring better insights out of the data. And all of this is most likely looking at maybe Q3 2024 as, as a possible timeline. So that's the future of the survey. Okay, that's great. An annual thing by keeping it simple uh, for the context of it being online. And yes, anyone who would like to help in this endeavor, please reach out to Jerome. It would be good to get more, more, more hands on deck to help make this successful well into the future. I guess we'll take one last, uh, one last um, o- uh, audience question slash comment and then we can call it a night. Um, Gordon, I'm just going to bring you up and we can ask you a question. Hi, Gordon. You can unmute and speak. Hi, hi everyone. Um, uh, Money convos. Um, I really appreciate you having this platform. Um, Jerome, well done, well done, well done, brother. Um, I actually started following you once I saw your research because it's it's something that's really new. Um, many a times you you go online searching for insights into petty petty um stuff that can help you. Let's say be able to invest and it's so hard to actually come by when you go on most of the um companies platform it's only pdfs that they usually share there isn't any proper um website that's showing insights that can be traced over about let's say two years five years ago you'd have to gather all these pdfs to actually make a decision as to even whether to buy a stock or, or not so jerome um this is really great. I'm sure you've actually um, provoked a lot of people to start calculating their hourly rate. I mean, hourly wage rate. 
because if you actually fall in under let's say 2500 then you're probably earning um, let's say one cd 90 pesos every hour you want to have a reality check and also start negotiating for better salaries we understand that in ghana the system has been turned upside down whereby you are employed and then they just tell you i'm going to give you 500 cds a month and you're okay because you're only thinking about your expenses but um are you really getting the value for your time on the job or not so jerome this is thought provoking this eye opening thank you so much um we'll also see my best way that i can support what you're doing and i'm following keenly so keep up the good job thank you guys thank you gordon for those words of encouragement yeah so um to to um, Jerome, I say a very big thank you again. Uh, to our audience, thank you for spending your Sunday nights with us uh, to to learn about these insights. Um, to Mimi and Sarah, who helped connect to Jerome, I appreciate you and I and everyone who contributed to the survey. The article lists a lot of names. A few other people I know. Um, we appreciate you all for helping Jerome for getting this done. And to everyone else, please remember to follow us here on Money Convos on Twitter and instagram and facebook on youtube wherever you listen to your podcast so like this kind of information can keep coming to you and then you can learn personal finance make better decisions and also follow jerome and when you get on instagram after looking at a few memes also go follow at investment friend investment underscore friend in fact before you follow uh, watch the memes do that and then trust me you you will be benefiting for that from that for some years to come Thank you all for the time once again. Have a good night and a great week ahead. Goodbye. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our thoughts. I hope you learned a thing or two and start practicing. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, Clubhouse and Facebook. And subscribe to our YouTube and podcast. Do tell a friend about Money Convos so we all become wealthy together. Talk to you soon. Bye.